The bill did not pass. But 65 years later, the United States Senate finally voted, finally voted to apologize for not having passed anti-lynching legislation when it was most needed. Senator Barber also put forward legislation to assist the National Youth Brigade, which provided educational and athletic activities for African-American children. He introduced a resolution to create a Senate committee to promote desegregation of the military. He put forward a bill to prohibit racial discrimination in public places, such as stores, hospitals, parks, and theaters. When the Women's Auxiliary Corps was created, it was Senator Barber who put forth an amendment requiring that it be integrated. And in explaining his reasoning behind insisting on that amendment, he said, and I quote, there cannot be any principle more important than that of having no discrimination so far as race, creed, or color is concerned. It's no surprise then to, to learn that he was appointed to the NAACP's board of directors of its legal defense and educational fund. In 1940, Senator Bar Barber proposed an unusual resolution which would have limited the president's power to suspend any citizen's civil liberties for one year, but it would have put a one-year cap on any kind of emergency curbing of civil, liber civil liberties. Had that bill passed, President Roosevelt would not have been able to proceed with the mass incarceration of Japanese Americans just two years later. Perhaps he could have done it for a short time, but in practi practice, it probably would have stopped it from happening. Sadly, Senator Barber's bill did not advance. In 1940 and 1941, he proposed a bill specifically intended to combat anti-Semitism in a unique way, which is to say, obviously, because of our of free speech guarantees in our Constitution, anti-Semitism cannot be outlawed in the U.S. But that doesn't mean that U.S. taxpayers have to support it. He proposed a bill that would have banned using the U.S. mails to send out anti-Semitic hate material. Unfortunately, that bill, too, did not, did not succeed. On the eve of World War II, Barber again broke ranks with most Republicans, most Democrats, on the question of isolation versus intervention. He supported President Roosevelt's Lend-Lease proposal, and he didn't mind using a little bit of a boxing analogy to explain his stance. He said, probably there are plenty of Americans who'd like to hang a good wallop on the underslung chin of Mr. Hitler. I know I would. And he wouldn't get up before the count either. But we'll have to hope that John Bull, England, with the aid of France, can do the job that has to be done. Soon after America entered the war, soon after Pearl Harbor, reports began appearing in the American press describing atrocities committed by the Germans and their collaborators against Jews in Europe on a scale it was previously unknown. You can find articles in the New York Times, not on the front page, and not above the fold, but they're there. Articles talking about massacres of thousands, tens of thousands of people, on a scale that really seemed unbelievable. By late 1942, the United States government and its allies publicly confirmed that the Germans were in fact engage in the systematic mass extermination, as they put it, mass extermination of the Jews of Europe, December 1942. And yet a month later, just one month later, a Gallup poll found that only 48% of Americans believed that that was true, even though their own government and the Churchill government and the other allies had all issued a declaration, still it was hard to penetrate American public opinion. And it was precisely because it was, it was so hard to get people to believe it, Jewish, uh, Jewish activist groups in the United States decided to stage a major 
event at Madison Square Garden in the spring of 1943. They called it a pageant. It was sort of a, a cross between a, a, a protest rally and a Broadway show, which is to say it, it featured a lot of the, the top stars of, of stage and screen in those days, Edward G. Robinson, Stella Adler. The script was written by Ben Hecht, the most famous script writer in Hollywood at the time. This rally was called We Will Never Die. It was very important in terms of shattering this aura of disbelief surrounding news about the mass killings. President Roosevelt refused to send a message of greeting to the rally. But Senator Barber, by contrast, was part of a small group of senators who put their names on the sponsoring committee of this event. It was that important to him. Just a few months later, as more news of the mass killings reached the U.S., and as Jewish groups pleaded with the administration to do something, and as administration spokesmen kept saying, nothing can be done except, nothing can be done to rescue the Jews except to win the war. In the midst of this, of this terrible atmosphere, five U.S. senators, Barber among them, issued a remarkable statement. Again, the theme of the, the Roosevelt administration's position on rescue was rescue through victory. Nothing could be done. These five senators issued a statement in July 1943 declaring if we wait until the war is won, there may be only corpses left to enjoy the victory. The position of the Roosevelt administration was that no significant number of Jewish refugees should be allowed into the country. Jewish groups began in the summer and autumn of 1943 putting forward a novel concept and that was temporary admission. Fine, don't, don't take them in as immigrants so you don't have to worry about these foreigners challenging American citizens for their jobs, but let them stay here temporarily just for the duration of the war. Let them escape torture and death, stay here and then leave after the war. This was a novel concept which Jewish groups began promoting, but which made little headway at first. But then in September 1943, the same activist group to whom I alluded earlier, the ones who organized that Madison Square Garden pageant, We Will Never Die, this activist group known as the Bergson Group privately persuaded the heads of the National Democratic Club and the National Republican Club, these are the umbrella groups for local party clubs around the country, local chapters, persuaded those two to issue a bipartisan statement calling for temporary haven. Now the idea of temporary haven and finally was being given a little, getting a little attention. Soon after that, the American Federation of Labor weighed in and also called for granting asylum, temporary asylum to refugees. Keep that in mind for a moment as I describe the next remarkable step in this process and as we, as we approach the point at which Barber, Senator Barber comes to play a major role. In October 1943, just a few days before Yom Kippur, the holiest day on the Jewish calendar, this Bergson group organized a march by 400 rabbis to the White House. They marched first to the Capitol and then to the White House to plead with President Roosevelt to, among other things, grant temporary haven to Jewish refugees. At least nine New Jersey rabbis, by the way, took part in this extraordinary march. And when I say extraordinary, keep in mind that while today it's a common thing for Jewish groups and all, all groups to, to march to the White House, nobody did that in 1943. In fact, this was the only Jewish protest in Washington during the entire Holocaust period. It was simply not done. American Jews in the 1940s were a community of immigrants and children of immigrants who for the most part did not feel fully accepted in American society. And the idea of marching to the White House and putting forward their particular Jewish, Jewish concerns was considered inappropriate. 
So these 400 rabbis did something that was entirely unprecedented. Nine, at least nine rabbis from New Jersey joined them, including, we just recently discovered, one of the most prominent rabbis in Patterson, Rabbi Bitzalel Cohen. And as this research continues, we're gonna find out more about that. But we do, I did find his name on a document showing that he was one of the rabbis who took part. President Roosevelt refused to meet with representatives of these 400 rabbis. But a handful of US senators, including Senator Barber, did. They came out of the Senate to greet them. And of course, I've wondered if Rabbi Cohen and Senator Barber may have shake, shook hands right then at that moment. Maybe not. But the fact that Barber and a few of his colleagues were willing to do, do, do this sent a, a powerful message to the White House that Congress was not necessarily going to keep going along with this idea of postponing rescue until it was too late. Roosevelt snubbed the rabbis. Warren Barber did not. One week after that march, and undoubtedly inspired by that encounter with these 400 venerated sages of the Jewish community, Senator Barber introduced his resolution directing the Secretary of State to arrange the admission of 100,000 Jews fleeing from the Nazis for the duration of the war and for six months after. The resolution was significant for several reasons. First, it elevated what until then was a Jewish concern, it elevated it to a congressional concern. This is not just a private grievance by a minority community, but, but, but members of the United States Senate shared those concerns. Secondly, the fact that it was a request for temporary admission was important, because that could attract public support. It was not like the more controversial idea of permanent, permanent immigration. Third, as I've, as I've noted, bipartisan support for temporary haven was beginning to gather momentum. And that was important. It was not a Republican issue, it was not a Democrat issue. It was an issue that was being championed by decent people who cared about trying to save lives. Furthermore, Warren Barber at that point was someone to be reckoned with. When the White House saw the resolution he was introducing, they understood he's not some freshman hothead. He was a well-regarded veteran of the United States Senate. He twice won elections at a time when FDR had carried the state of New Jersey in that year's presidential election. And New Jersey was an important state in presidential elections. With 16 electoral votes, it was a significant, a significant state as the president began to think in terms of re-election the following year. Barber was a moderate Republican, which made him a potential political headache for the administration. So on all these levels, Barber's resolution was powerful and important. And yet, as we know, just a short time later, November 22, 1943, at the age of just 55, Warren Barber suffered a fatal heart attack in his home in Washington, D.C. The resolution he introduced went no further. Generally speaking, in Congress, for a bill to, to, to move ahead, there has to be somebody who is particularly attached to it, really devotes himself to it. And, and without the author and initiator of the bill there, it could not go any further. But there's a second important reason why it didn't go further. And that's because it was superseded in the autumn of 1943 by a major public controversy over the issue of whether or not the United States should do anything to rescue Jews from the Holocaust. The very issue that Barber had been so energetically promoting. It became the subject of controversy because this aforementioned Bergson group persuaded members of the House and Senate to introduce a resolution calling on the president to create a new government agency whose only purpose would be to rescue Jewish refugees from the Holocaust. 
Until this point, it was the State Department that was in charge of immigration, of administering the President's immigration policy and its non-rescue policy. And the argument of this new congressional resolution was that the State Department had failed to do it. The President's policy was unsatisfactory. We needed a new government agency whose only purpose would be to rescue the Jews. The administration fought against this resolution tooth and nail. An Assistant Secretary of State was sent to Capitol Hill to testify against it. But his testimony was so full of exaggerations and unsubstantiated claims about how much supposedly had been done to rescue the Jews that his testimony backfired and the controversy snowballed. At the same time that those events were happening on Capitol Hill, senior aides to the Secretary of the Treasury, the only Jewish member of the cabinet, Henry Morgenthau Jr., several of his top aides had discovered evidence that the State Department had been suppressing news about the mass killings of the Jews and had actually been blocking opportunities to rescue Jewish refugees, all motivated by the same concern that if America started rescuing refugees, then there would be pressure to bring them here. These aides to Morgenthau went to their boss with a report that they compiled bearing the incredible title report to the secretary on the acquiescence of this government in the murder of the Jews. Morgenthau toned down the title and he took the report to the president. And this was the first time in Secretary Morgenthau's entire career, more than a decade in Roosevelt's cabinet, the first time that he mustered the wherewithal to talk to, to go straight to the president, to ask him to do something for the Jewish people. So he presented the president with essentially a political problem. Here's a report showing a scandal going on in your State Department. Here's a policy of yours, which is increasingly being criticized from Capitol Hill to marching rabbis. And by the way, it's an election year. I don't know if Morgenthau used those exact words, but he didn't have to. Franklin Roosevelt understood that it was an election year. And so he decided that the most expedient thing to do would be to preempt all this tumult in Congress, preempt that resolution by creating this rescue agency unilaterally by executive order. In Jan January 1944, the president created a new agency called the War Refugee Board. The War Refugee Board. The first proposal that this War Refugee Board made to the President after it came into existence was to grant temporary haven to Jewish refugees so they could come to America. And in some of the news coverage of this proposal and of the discussions about it, some of the Jewish magazines I looked at from the period I found references, recollections, that this proposal for temporary haven, as we recall, was originated with Senator Barber from New Jersey. So although he was no longer around, his bold proposal had not been forgotten. It helped stimulate the conversation and the thinking about the importance of granting temporary haven. The importance of doing something, doing something the War Refugee Board proposed to bring hundreds of thousands of Jewish refugees to America. The President, interestingly, decided to commission a private Gallup poll. Now, as is well known, public opinion had been very strongly against immigration throughout the 1930s and into the war period. The President wanted to sort of you know, test the waters and see what was public opinion thinking about this idea of temporary haven. And Gallup came back to him and said, 70% of the people who we polled, of this representative sample of the American public, 70% support allowing in an unlimited number of refugees for the duration of the war. 70%. The tide of the war had changed. It was clear America was going to win the war. News of the, what we call the Holocaust, had reached the American press. People were beginning to understand what was happening. And hearts, hearts were opening. 
70% of Americans were willing to take in an unlimited number of refugees temporarily. Sadly, the president agreed to allow in temporarily just one group of 982 European Jewish refugees. They arrived in the late summer of 1944. They were housed in an abandoned army camp in upstate New York, Oswego, New York. Warren Barber took upon himself an enormous challenge, seeking to change the Roosevelt administration's long established policy of turning a blind eye to the persecution of Europe's Jews. Achieving policy change in wartime and in the face of strong opposition from the president and his administration is especially difficult. The process, the process that led from the first calls for temporary havens until the actual creation of one such haven more than a year later involved many factors. Clearly, Warren Barber's efforts were one of those factors. He helped legitimize and publicize this concept of temporary haven. The fact that only 982 Jewish refugees were admitted was no fault of Barber's. And in any event, the many thousands of children, grandchildren, other descendants of those 982 who are alive today as a result of the Oswego Haven are a reminder of the preciousness of each and every life rescued from that inferno and the importance of appro appropriately recognizing those who helped make it happen. Now we can answer, I think, the question that I posed at the beginning of my remarks. Barber had no discernible political motives for his efforts on behalf of the Jews in Europe or his efforts against anti-Semitism or his efforts on behalf of African-American civil rights. Those efforts didn't bring him votes. They didn't help his stature in the Republican Party. And he had no aspirations for higher office. That leaves us with the simplest of explanations. Warren Barber was simply a decent human being. He was raised by parents who valued and taught racial and religious tolerance. The initiatives he undertook as a United States Senator reflected those values. Fighting against lynching and racial discrimination, condemning Hitler's anti-Jewish persecution, attempting to link trade and human rights, seeking legal ways to undermine anti-Semitism, challenging President Roosevelt's abandonment of the Jews, and finally, seeking to rescue 100,000 Jewish refugees. Warren Barber, took the values he learned while growing up and tried to implement them as a United States Senator. Shortly after Senator Barber passed away, the leaders of New Jersey's major Jewish organizations announced that they would raise the funds to plant a memorial forest of 15,000 trees near Jerusalem as a token of, as they put it, their appreciation and gratitude for the service rendered by Senator Barber to the Jewish people of New Jersey as a minority group. Barber Forest today stands as a monument to a man who did everything in his power until his dying day to aid the Jewish people in their darkest hour and indeed to help protect all minority groups whose rights or well-being were threatened. Thank you very much. We, we have a few minutes. Uh, thank you, Dr. Medoff, for that outstanding presentation. I think you all understand why we felt this story had to be told. We do have time for a few questions, if, uh, if there are any from the, from the audience. And, and we do have a presentation to make after that. So please don't, don't run off. Um, are there any questions about, about the presentation today? Yes, in the back. Speak really loudly.
The question is, did we discover in our research any evidence of any particular Jewish friends or, or donors or associates of Senator Barber's? And the answer is no. Um, as I mentioned, he did occasionally appear at Jewish communal events, such as the Passover Seder, to which we alluded, um, and some other, there was other interactions with the Jewish community on a public level. But I did not find in the correspondence any specific personal Jewish friends or contributors to his campaigns. There must have been some, but I imagine if there were any significant ones, they would have emerged in the correspondence that, that we did find. So it, it seems like um, the answer appears to be no. Any? Yes. The question is, why was there so, such widespread American Jewish um, electoral support for President Roosevelt despite his policies of, of keeping out Jewish refugees and so on? The level of Jewish support for FDR in each of, each of his elections approached 90%, which is really extraordinary. Most of what I have referred to about what is known by most historians as the abandonment of the Jews was not known to the American Jewish community broadly at the time. It's not that it was a secret. You could find some of this in the Jewish press and other sources, but there was no widespread understanding of the fact that the administration had a deliberate policy of looking away from the, of the genocide in Europe. So, so the first reason that Jews did not turn against Roosevelt uh, at, the, at the, the voting booths was because they didn't realize entirely what the, um, the, the scope of the administration's Jewish refugee policy. But the other reason is though, think about from their point of view, think about the alternative. The Republican Party did not appear to most Jewish voters as a very attractive alternative. It was known, especially before the war, as the party of isolation, the party that was the least interested in confronting Hitler. And as opposed to immigrate, the Republicans were as opposed to immigration as most Democrats were. So from the point of view of that generation of American Jews, it didn't seem like there was, there was necessarily a better alternative. Had some of the facts which I've described come out at the time, it's possible things would have been somewhat different. But that was not the case. So this is a bit of a longer story than we have time for here. But, ju but just to briefly, so the question is, in my most recent book, I talk about um, some evidence of Jewish dissent from support for Roosevelt, specifically in 1944. In the summer of 1944, the Republican Party took the very unusual step of becoming the first major political party to put in its platform a call for the creation of a Jewish state in Palestine. So the Republican Party was the first to embrace the goal of the Zionist movement. As a result of the Republicans putting that in their platform, the Democrats then felt they had to match it. And although the president and his administration were, uh, were not at all enthusiastic about this, they felt like they didn't have a choice because, although in retrospect we know that FDR won by large margins each time, it didn't look that way um, necessarily in 1944. And many in the Democratic Party felt it would be a close election. And Jewish votes were very important in New York, which in those days had the largest number of electoral votes. And since the Republican nominee was the governor of New York, Thomas Dewey, there were many in the White House around the president who were afraid that Dewey and the Republicans might be able to lure or track some of those Jewish voters in New York. So the Democrats matched that platform, that, that platform plank. In their convention a few weeks later, they put in a very similar pro-Zionist platform. And that was the first time in American political history that there was actually a, a concerted effort to attract the Jewish vote, as we call it. Yes?
So the question is, um, were many American Jews afraid to rock the boat, so to speak? And did that change in any way after the infamous episode of the ship of refugees, the St. Louis, which was turned away um, in 1939? This phenomenon of not wanting to rock the boat um, is something that's not unique to American Jews. This is something which you can find in the histories of most um, ethnic minorities in the United States. The first generation are particularly uneasy about being seen as troublemakers. They naturally want to be accepted in American society. So it, that was very, it was very much a phenomenon in the thinking of many American Jews, but, but not only American Jews. That, it was a, that's a common concern um, of minorities. The, the, the episode involving the refugee ship, the St. Louis, um, which took place in 1939, it did not have a major impact on thinking in the Jewish community for this reason. When President Roosevelt turned the ship away, and I say President Roosevelt because the passengers were sending telegrams to the White House, and the President you know, made the decision. When the ship was turned away, the assumption was that it was going back to Nazi Germany. And this is the Nazi Germany where just a few months earlier, that terrible pogrom took place, to which I alluded earlier. But what happened during the two-week voyage back from the United States to Europe was that four European countries each agreed to take in a portion of the passengers. So the ship did not go back to Nazi Germany. The passengers were divided up. England, France, Holland, and Belgium each took about one-fourth of the passengers. And so at the time, it seemed like the passengers had, in fact, been saved. Going back to Europe was obviously not their first choice, but it was not the same as going back to Nazi Germany. So while it was not considered a victory, it was still not the same as sending them right back into Hitler's hands. So, so just a year later, three of those four countries were invaded by the Germans. Um, and yes, at the time, people had a sense that the situation in Europe was extremely fragile. Europe appeared to be on the verge of a major war. So sending the Jews back into Belgium and Holland and France while it didn't seem like a great idea, it sure looked a lot better than going back to Germany. Of the St. Louis passengers, only the ones who went to England survived. Some of those in the other countries survived, which is to say, you know, the St. Louis passengers who went back to France were murdered in the Holocaust at about the same rate as other Jews in France. So there were some, some of those in the other countries survived, but many were murdered. Um, but at the time, people did not realize they didn't, the, 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 the rejection of the St. Louis did not seem quite the same that we, as we see it today in retrospect. Yes? So, uh, what if you're, you're telling Barber took the very progressive uh, position that he was out there in front of the political party and most other Americans and the Lynching Bill, the anti, you know, in terms of accepting refugees, was there any background? Not that I'm aware of. Um, now, if we had his, if we had his actual papers, then we'd have all the hate mail, and I'd be able to give you a more informed answer. When I was when I was looking at um, you know, his, cor his, his correspondence that he had with other, let's say, political figures you wouldn't see that kind of thing. So although I did not find evidence of it, I suspect that if his full papers had survived, we'd have a much better idea of what kind of hostility he might have encountered from various groups who would have resented his positions. But not in terms of public criticism. That I didn't, I didn't see any of, which is interesting. Yes? Uh, in researching uh, his uh, background, three government services, what was the employment practices of the mills compared to others as far as their support of minorities? That's interesting. Maybe that's something that you know more about. I, I don't have any, any uh, significant information. In fact, during that era, there was a, a relatively small African-American community in Patterson. It wasn't, Eddie, may, uh, I mean, Jimmy may know more about that, uh, about this, the, 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 the large 
African American population that came into Patterson was really part of the the Great Migration during in the in the World War One and then World War Two era. Uh, I would, I, as I recall, the 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 African American population in town was was relatively small. It it and I I I don't I do know that um, that Barber's political attitudes during when he became a U.S. Senator towards labor practices were, were progressive um, uh, in, in terms of union rights, uh, minimum wage, a prevailing wage. He was relatively progressive. But the business was a, was a there, there were strikes in the barber mills over the years, not to the same degree that there were, you know, the, that there were in the silk industry here in town. But uh, uh, maybe Jimmy, you know, do you know? Yeah. What year are you talking about? Uh, uh, the Wood Era, 1910. For the most part, African-Americans were not really accepted in Patterson. Yeah, the, the, just, yeah, just. African-Americans were not really accepted in Patterson as far as the labor force. Even though they may have been here, as residents, they were not part of the immediate workforce. 1824, during the construction of the Mars Canal, rather than have African Americans work for the Mars Canal, there was a petition launched to bring the Irish, which happens to do with the, the Irish occupation in Patterson. But for the most part, African Americans have never really, really, truly been accepted in the African American community throughout the era that you're talking about. Uh, and I'm hoping that I'm real long, so I, I don't want to talk it. This is not my program. That's right. Well, that'll be another conversation for another day. But well, thank you. Leonard? So the question is, were the Jews who were in President Roosevelt's inner circle at all outspoken during the Holocaust years? And if not, why were they silent when Senator Barber, a Christian, was outspoken? There were a number of American Jews who were, um, who were in the President's um, closest circle of advisors. You mentioned Sam Rosenman who was his chief speech writer and senior advisor. And there were others, including Supreme Court Justice Felix Frankfurter, behind the scenes, even though he was a Supreme Court Justice, was very involved in advising the president. Uh, there was Ben Cohen. Um, you mentioned Henry Morgenthau, the cabinet minister, uh, cabinet sec uh, treasury secretary. But only a certain kind of Jew could reach that level of um, that position within the administration. It was only someone who was not willing to talk about Jewish concerns or Jewish affairs. And we know this from the private correspondence of Frankfurter, of Cohen, of Rosenman, that they felt extremely uncomfortable about being seen as Jews. They were worried about the perception that they might be asking the president to help the Jews. And so they were extremely careful never to raise any of these issues. And when I mentioned Morgenthau going to the president in 1944, that was the only time he did it. And, it, it. and he only did it after his staff, who were incidentally all Protestants, 
after they had un uncovered this scandalous behavior and pushed Morgenthau to do it. So this was a, so the people we're talking about were individuals who were um, what we would call very assimilated or cu acculturated, meaning that they suppressed their Jewish identity, they were uncomfortable with being perceived by the public as Jews, and that was, and that was what President Roosevelt preferred because he did not want his Jewish advisors bugging him about those gas chambers and crematory and ships full of refugees and so forth. So they played the role that he wanted them to play. They contributed in, in, in very important ways to the New Deal and other, other significant um, achievements at the time. But from a Jewish point of view, they were not part of any, uh, I mean, except for the one instance with Morgenthau, they were not part of any effort to try to persuade President Roosevelt that maybe something could be done to rescue some Jews from the Holocaust. So that made Senator Barber even more courageous. I, and I agree with this gentleman's comment because um, very often, understandably, a political figure will take his cues from the Jewish community. He won't necessarily want to go out on a limb if the Jews themselves, if the Jewish community itself is not interested in an issue. Now, there were Jews who were, in America, were deeply concerned about what was happening in Europe and who spoke out. I've mentioned this march by 400 rabbis and certain other things, but these were sort of the minority in the Jewish community. So, yes, for Senator Barber to sort of take a chance and, and, and extend himself this way is, is, makes his efforts all the more admirable and noteworthy. I think we have time for one last question. Mark? Thank you. Uh, um, th thank you all. We have a, one more part of the program. I'd like to call up the committee uh, for, from the Jewish Historical Society uh, to help with the presentation of, uh, of a, a certificate of appreciation. Let me, let me just read it. This is, uh, we, have, we have a certificate of, of appreciation for all of the Barber grandchildren who are here today. And, And, and let me just read what it says. It says, W. Warren Barber served in the United States Senate from 1931 and to 1936, and again from 1938 to 1943. During his tenure, Barber was a leading voice for social justice and the rights of minorities and Jewish refugees. When the world was threatened with the horrors of Nazism, racism, Barber was one of the few voices to speak out and move the United States into action. Barber was fearless and challenged the political order of his day. In recognition of Barber's efforts to promote tolerance, his resolve to assist refugees and combat prejudice, the Jewish Historical Society of North Jersey is pleased to sponsor an event honoring W. Warren Barber in Patterson, New Jersey, and we pr proudly present our expression of appreciation to members of the Barber family. Come on up, and you can you can come up and accept your uh, your your. What's that? Oh, let me. I'm gonna I'm gonna have to take out my notes to get everybody's name because I want I want to uh, make sure I get this right. Jamie Higgins, uh, uh, Paige Barber, Alexis Webb, Lisa Miller, Warren, and Ellen Red. Uh, please come up, and, and if I miss somebody, let me know. Uh, did, uh, what? 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 Do we have? Do we have Tony one? Oh, and Tony, we have one for you as well. Suzanne.
crazy. Thank you. Thank you. And no presentation to be complete, Raphael. We have a we have a student. Let's get a, a group picture. There's a lot of you. I as I said, eight barbers, no waiting. Come, come, sure, come on in. Joy, anyone, anyone else from the committee? <laughs> All right. Jimmy, can you get this picture? Or do you want people to group? Joy, come on to the picture. Mike? I got it. I'm so excited. Oh, you want this up here? Oh, I don't want to block out on it. You need, need to come around here. You need to come around here. You got to get here. We got this in front. All right. All right. Somebody pick you up. Okay. Right. <laughs> Okay. Let, let me just close by saying um, it's been this has been an outstanding project for us. We've gotten to make some new friends. We're we're pleased that you were all here to uh, to be part of this program. Um, we are uh, an organization that um, depends on your support in order to achieve anything, and we uh, uh, we will look forward to seeing all of you at at other upcoming events. I don't know if we're going to be able to top this one for quite a while. It was, a, it was an enormous effort by a great committee and great guests. And thank you all for coming. Yeah. That was great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This is definitely over the top. It was, we well, don't deserve any of this. Uh, that's, well. More pictures? <laughs> All right. what, what was say about the bar? No, I, I can I can leave the, I can leave this here and just get myself out of it. We go who's certificates? What's that? Did we run short? No, the no. from Birmingham. No, we have they have the. Watch me, everyone. Do, do we, we? We we didn't run short. No, we. Huh? Yeah, here, husband, sir. No, no. Okay. Straight to that. Here we go. Here we go. Here we go. Yeah. Oh, you, you got it. This was a good crowd. Yeah, yeah, I think so. I think so. Oh, I don't know. I'm only going to let these come out if somebody can Photoshop less hair and less, <laughs> more hair and less back. Yeah, no, you know, you've got the barber built. Do you? The, you <laughs> but, Great. Thank you so okay. Much. Thanks. Okay. I have a letter I need to get to you. Okay. So don't leave without seeing me. Okay. All right. Okay. Thank you. Thanks for, so much for coming. Oh, okay. Hi. How are you? Congratulations. Thank you. It was a great program. I really worked out. This has been one of the most informative presentations I could have hoped to attend. I learned so much about Senator Barber. Um, the pr professor Raphael um, is wonderful. He is Professor Medoff is one of the most intelligent people that I've come to know over the years with the David Wyman Institute. And as I said, it was a pleasure to be here. But more than that, it was extremely informative. Thank you so so much. Hello, this was a very inspiring program today, and it's inspiring to know what local historians can uh, dig up about uh, human care, tolerance, and all the good things that keep us together as a society. I'm very happy for the scholarship of Dr. Medoff and for the sleuthing work of Richard Poulton and for everybody in the Jewish Historical Society 
who supported this saw, had the vision, and uh, made it happen. I hope this will be the first of many programs, and I hope that the scholarship of uh, William Barber and his fight for tolerance continues. Thank you. Okay. Hi, I'm Debbie Grossman, treasurer of the Jewish Historical Society. I am so glad I was able to attend this afternoon's event. Dr. Madoff was an exceptionally well-informed speaker. His presentation was wonderful and was really very interesting to listen to and to learn some unknown facts about our history. So this is a wonderful program today. My name is Glenn Corbett. I'm from Bergen County, actually, in Waldwick. Uh, but I have a great interest in Patterson, as many people do here. And uh, this is an absolutely uh, wonderful, eye-opening presentation about something we didn't know a lot, a lot about, but we certainly know about the barbers, but particularly um, the barbers that played a big role here in Patterson's history inside this wonderful barber mill. So uh, it was, a, again, a, a tremendous presentation, and uh, we look forward to more from the Jewish Historical Society in northern New Jersey. Today was a wonderful event for the Jewish Historical Society of North Jersey, as well as for the Barber family. It is always wonderful when we find somebody dedicated and courageous who fights for the rights of others. And we were very proud to present that to everyone today. We thank everyone who came out for this program and we hope that what was what Senator Barber always fought for will resonate in everyone's heart and mind and we all continue to be wonderful courageous people and fight for the rights of all. Uh, it was such a, an honor to be here to learn about the senator, a lot of stories that we had no idea about, um, and to see what an impact he made on this community and others. It was really a, a special weekend and I thank everybody involved uh, for having us come up. What are you doing? The event was excellent, very informative, very emotional, and we were very happy to take part in it. I thought the speaker was superb. I thought he had a strong control of all the facts and history and how he related everything without comment to uh, extraneous issues, just facts, and laid out a history that a lot of people were unaware of. And I think it was super that we had the program. Thank you. Thank you. Well, uh, see the presentation, it was wonderful, very informative, and a lot of tremendous research was done on Barber, and I think he did some terrific work for people of the uh, New Jersey, Jewish people, and uh, as setting a precedent for the uh, way people should act in those kinds of situations. Thank you. Thank you, too.